for the Disaster Recovery and Resilience team at OHCS. We are the primary uh, agency implementing the CDBGDR grant, aka ReOregon. Um, we, um, I got a couple of my colleagues here with us, Lauren Dressen, who is our Chief of Operations, Adina Haslip, who is our Chief of Compliance and Contracting, um, and then also a couple of my regional uh, representatives, Blanca Luce and Mary Haberling, who works closely with me on external affairs. Um, well, I'm going to jump in. We have uh, a dozen or so folks here, but I don't think so many that um, that uh, folks shouldn't feel free to interrupt if uh, if I'm not being clear. If you've got a question, I'm sure somebody else does. So um, feel free to feel free to jump in um, and get up some slides. Um, I'm gonna recap very briefly the the um, peer program itself uh, do a high level order of operations because that's what's been tweaked a little bit between the the gui policy guidelines that you may have reviewed last fall and and the um, the the set that we sent out um, just last week um, then we'll focus uh, the rest of the time on the selection selection process and how we how we get from selection to contracting. So to uh, as a reminder, the peer program um, covers peer stance for planning, infrastructure, economic revitalization and mitigation is also an eligible activity. Um, and I think um, I think I um, I like the language that we used in the latest version a little bit better than what we had before. Um, and what what we're doing is we we believe that housing recovery is sort of the center of uh, recovery for the state. Um, but we are aware that people can't, you know, build housing without infrastructure to serve it. And um, folks can't afford uh, housing without um, an opportunity to to have a job in their community. So while we while there is the requirement um, that there be an direct or indirect connection to housing, um, that's intended to be read quite broadly. Um, mitigate and all of those activities must tie back in some way, refer back in some way to an impact of the 2020 fires. In the area of mitigation, there is not a requirement to to look back to the 2020 fires. Um, HUD uh, through this program is interested in mitigating uh, to the extent that you all are interested in using the dollars that way, mitigating any identified uh, future disaster and, and mitigation means a pretty broad range of activities that would reduce expected loss of life or property from one of those expected disasters. The eligible um, entities to to lead projects to to execute projects under this grant um, are any any local uh, or county government um, agency or district. Um, by district, we explicitly mean um, economic development districts. Um, we think they're the, the logical um, economic development or economic revitalization. Uh, well, we've been made aware that they're, they're, um, they're at least the preferred economic revitalization lead in Jackson County, um, and we think that that's certainly appropriate. Um, we included schools, knowing schools have had some infrastructure impacts, public housing authorities, again, they, if they, they're seeing an infrastructure barrier um, to their work. Um, I, I've been uh, informed that we're, we're a little redundant here. Councils of Government, I guess, are ORS, ORS 190 organization, so would fit in that first bullet as well. But um, we also called them out explicitly. Um, 
And then we, we've got this line here, nonprofit entities with a specific public role. And, and what we had when we wrote that in mind, we, uh, we had we were thinking about soil and water conservation districts. Um, there are a number of sort of uh, nonprofit organizations that do have identified roles. Um, and we we think that they they would be appropriate to carry out projects. If you all are aware of just nonprofits that wouldn't fit in this list that you think are, you know, important uh, to be named as eligible, um, we're certainly open to that discussion. There are additional risks for us for working with you know, a wide range of nonprofits. We, but um, if that's if that's important to the recovery in your county, um, you know, we certainly are uh, willing to consider it. Um, HUD did recently um, issue a blanket notice um, allowing for funding to privately owned for-profit utilities. Um, though any any for-profit utility work must prioritize low and moderate income benefits. Um, so they they put an additional restriction on that when they open that possibility. Um, so anyway, those are those are um, eligible entities to lead projects, whether as a subrecipient or a subgrantee. And I'll talk a little bit more about the distinction between those two in a second. Um, at a very high level, we've sent you the guidelines. The next step would be for you all to convene your selection committees. I know some have already begun those discussions, which is great. Um, finalize how you want you want to select projects because you have quite a bit of leeway to define that yourselves. Um, then we will we will either sub uh, either contract with a subrecipient to carry out a project or we may subcontract with a subrecipient and direct them to make a sub grant to a project lead so the selection committee should inform us of the project leads you want to see and the amount of dollars that you have approved for their projects ohcs is reserving for ourselves the ability to figure out the contracting method that works best. We've obviously got a lot of workload and to manage. Um, and so we we are reserving ourselves the ability to limit the total number of subrecipients that we're going to be uh, working through. Um, and then depending upon each pro each project lead, depending upon whether they're responsible to a, a subrecipient or responsible directly to OH OHCS, that subrecipient or OHCS would be entering an agreement with them and giving them permission to proceed. Um, so turning to the selection committee, um, we we um, required that you all include all the local governments, um, the general purpose local governments directly impacted by the fires, the long term recovery group, um, the, uh, the economic development district, although we, we definitely um, provided for uh, if the economic development district isn't the logical economic development representative that uh, you all could could uh, bring use a different one in Douglas, Klamath, Lincoln and Lynn Marion. Um, we are uh, requiring you all to um, include the relevant uh, key tribe. Um, I did get a question from one county if the tribe chooses to opt out of that role. Is that OK? Uh, that's certainly certain. We would not have an objection to that, um, but uh, we, we certainly want them to have the opportunity to uh, to be included in the discussion. Um, you are free to add other other bodies that, that you'd like to bring on. I mean, our our goal was with as we were thinking about this, was for the group to be broad enough that it represents multiple different interests, but to be small enough that it's um, small enough for for dialogue and you know uh, 
to to be able to move without without um, too much involvement. Um, to the mechanics of the vote, we do we are requiring that there be a super majority supportive of the projects. Um, we, we're allowing for that to be um, provided in writing rather than necessarily somebody attending a meeting. So this isn't we're not following formal uh, public meeting law here or nonprofit board meeting. So in writing in writing is just fine. Um, we the there is uh we we did uh require that that final selection that when when you're making when the selection committee is making the final selection we we should believe that that should be transparent and open to the pro to the public um and there is a requirement from hud that at least one formal public hearing be held um a, as projects are identified for funding um, and you are certainly welcome to and encouraged to 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 add additional process to that if you like. So um, moving to that process. So we oh Matt, go go for it, please. Yeah, Alex, thanks. Um, Matt Lawyer, Marion County. So with regards to that public hearing, um, you just mentioned that there's not necessarily a formal process in terms of the minutes and the uh, you know all that stuff, but um, is there going to be clearly defined process for what how that public hearing needs to be noticed? Because I know HUD has some very specific standards on that. There's a time period for the notification. I think it's like how many days prior to all that. Is that going to be outlined in this process? Yeah, that's all. I believe that is all identified in the policy guidelines. Yeah, um, and and there there is um, yes. Okay, I may have missed that, so I apologize if I'm asking a redundant question. Thank you. No problem. Um, and uh, I'm sure somebody on my team can correct me and check uh, if that isn't fully spelled out. Um, but I'm pretty confident it is. Um, the so we we left you all the flexibility if um, you um, have already. I mean, we're. We are obviously two years, more than two years past the disaster. If you have a process up through which you've already identified a project or two um, and you are anxious to move that forward immediately, we left you all the flexibility to do that. Um, we ask you to provide us that, you know, some narrative on that previous process and, and what the what the uh, selection what what the uh, logic was um but uh and then in terms of the balance of the funds um we suspect many of you all will choose to do some level of public uh uh solicitation of projects it doesn't have to be you know published in the portland business journal and all come uh you may choose to to uh, direct that notice to the particular entities that you think are most uh most likely to execute these kinds of projects. Um, so you have you have pretty broad latitude in how to structure that. Um, we have provided you a model uh, project description form. It's an it's an application for, uh, but we we've, we've called it the project description form. Um, you are free to customize that. You know, our thought being you may have selection criteria that aren't necessarily spoken to in the way that we develop that model project description form. Um, so you are welcome to customize it. The policy guidelines do lay out some of the, the minimum requirements, though, that um, that need to be uh, need to remain in that project description form. One slight change from uh, the last uh, time we sent out these documents is we have taken out some of the risk and capacity assessment questions in the project description form. We've decided as an agency we want to do a uniform process on that, which we would be doing prior to contracting. So it felt like that would be redundant work 
for um, for local agencies to also provide information in the project description form. But if your selection committee, you know, would wants to wants to see that information, again, you'd be free to add it. Um, so um, we um, we we do require that you document your selection process, i.e., that that decision making meeting, um, how how the decision was reached, what selection criteria you okay. use. Um, I'm flagging here for you all just to remind as a reminder um, for all of us. We the the reason that there is a 500 K minimum on projects, um, which should be part of my PowerPoint here, um, is because these are federal funds with all the requirements um, that always come with those and um, I don't know a lot of extra ones, but some obviously HUD specific versions of uh, each of those. So that that and you know to emphasize, one dollar into a project um, federalizes the entire project as far as the federal government is concerned. Uh, and particularly important when we're thinking about environmental review. Um, applying for federal funds does require you to no longer make any more. Um, course determining decisions. I'm I'm butchering the exact uh, technical language, right? But once you state that you are seeking federal funds for a project, you cannot continue working on it until you have got through environmental review. So that so to the extent that um, you or or um, applicants are thinking about. Um, funding for projects that are already underway. That's a that's a really important thing to be aware of and to note. Um, prevailing wage in the form of Davis Bacon is required. There will be, of course, monitoring. Um, you've got stand the the federal uh, procurement rules. Um, we will uh, be applying a duplication of benefits analysis, and there are some questions about that in in the project description form. It is fine to use these dollars to match, um, say, a, a MIT uh, uh, award or a public assistance award, but um, we do need to make sure that, you know, we're not funding the, uh, uh, again, um, the uh, the project that's already, already received uh, recovery funds. Um, there are really extensive rules around program income. I'm not going to go into those today because we don't expect many of these projects to have program income. Um, but uh, but uh, for those that will, um, we'll definitely provide additional technical assistance on that. Yeah, Darren, please. Um, you know, you uh, you had mentioned that Davis Bacon applies in federal rules regarding spending federal dollars. Uh, if you're a public agency in Oregon, are we also uh, required to comply with uh, all the various rules related to state procurement and contracting in BOLI as well as uh, in, in cases of, of, I know in highway projects, we, we do an analysis to make sure that uh, we look at BOLI wages as well as Davis-Bacon because we, we have to pay the higher of the two whichever one's highest is. Do you know if that applies in this particular case? I'm confident that the the outcome that we need to get to is what you just described exactly. I mean, I meeting both requirements um, exactly. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Adina is still with us. She's been working on um, some model uh, subrecipient agreements and I'm sure thinking about this question. So. Thank yeah, you. I can I can help a little bit, but uh, overall, the 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 federal provisions follow the funds. So whatever we are required to do with the the funds, all the federal provisions. I think there are fifty eight of them. Davis Bacon is is definitely part of the construction projects. Those get passed down with the funds, so and those are all applicable to Nadina. I'm projects. sure you are not only focus on what uh, our discussion here. The specific question was, um, are all of the state uh, procurement and state uh, re requirements also be part of these contracts? 
Oops. Yes, so we we had an option to either uh, take on the federal procurement processes or they um, um, choose ours, and we did. Um, there are some exceptions on a couple of provisions, but overall it's state procurement processes. So um, would you say again, so it, would it be state and federal procurement or the, the, the um, procurement is there? We have opted on state, but I will have to check on how okay. um, they passed on, on then, to other agencies or okay. type of agencies. Okay. Um, we, um, great. We, we will, um, it, Dina is working on, um, as I mentioned, some model uh, subrecipient agreements that we're going to be, of course, uh, seek, seeking DOJ um, uh, uh, approval of. Um, we expect to limit negotiation on contract terms to scope. We're going to do our very best to limit the, the generic boilerplate to what has to be in there for federal and state compliance. But um, for your sake and our sake and getting the dollars out, we're, we're going to hold the line on negotiating Dating uh, a lot of the boilerplate language. Um, there, as I mentioned, there's the required public involvement. I think. Um, thank you, Amy. Uh, put that the reference to that um, in the chat. Um, and um, seventy percent max round one. So. Um, we are, we're directing you all in your initial allocation of dollars to not allocate more than 70% of your allocation. Um, we left wiggle room for us to give you permission to do that, to exceed that if, you, if um, you've got a good reason to. But given that all of the oversight costs aren't, would not be built into the project budgets that the selection committee is going to be reviewing. Um, we want we want to start there, and uh, and as we figure out, you know what what are the negotiated <clears throat> uh, oversight costs for subrecipients overseeing subgrantees um, that we that we hold funds to make sure that we're not asking subrecipients to carry out more work than we're. Um, we're able to pay them for. So the selection committee would be forwarding to us that those project descriptions, uh, documentation that the selection committee uh, approved, th those projects and the project lead and the award amount. Um, so um, this is a little bit more detailed step by step. Um, I put OHCS informal review first. If you all are seeing projects as a selection committee, and for whatever reason, you have a concern that this may or may not be a, a CDBGDR eligible project, you're certainly welcome to send that, those to us for a preliminary sort of consultation. But in terms of formal action, the first step would be the, the selection committee selecting the project. We would then do a more formal review at our end. We would determine what we think is the right contracting approach, whether that's direct a direct subrecipient or as a sub subgrantee to another subrecipient that we've identified. Um, and then in the case of our subrecipients, we'll be doing a risk and capacity assessment of them in terms of subgrantees. The subrecipient will be doing a risk and capacity assessment of their subgrantees, and then um, OACS will be issuing formal award negotiate uh, uh, announcements and entering, you know, beginning the contracting process with our subrecipients, and subrecipients would be doing the same with their subgrantees. Um, I should say, at this point, we are not. We are not um, limiting strictly, you know, one subrecipient per county. If we could do that, we, that would be 
great for us, and we think that that would probably move the process fastest. But we acknowledge that there may be some cases where, you know, for whatever reason, um, that doesn't make sense. So we are open to having some subrecipients that are um, that are executing projects themselves. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the dog and pony show. Um, welcome any more questions or, you know, um, certainly happy to take questions in, in writing as well um, as we as we move forward. But uh, appreciate your your attention. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing how you all want to put these dollars to work. Matt, thanks for the uh, you know, your chat choice limiting action. It's the term of art for uh, for NEPA. Yeah, I got a quick question, Alex. Um, the Cascades West Economic Development District is our nearest district, but mm -hmm. um, and there are some members there. Commissioner Buck from Lane County is one of the members, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure if her participation would would that qualify as somebody from the Economic Development District? Um, no, I think we'd want a, a representative of the of the um, cog as a whole. I mean, at the end of the day, right? We 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 don't um, we'd like to avoid the county having two votes, right? So the, sure. I mean, the the point the point of requiring multiple entities is to have multiple viewpoints at the table. OK, so in, I totally understand that. That makes sense. Um, my question then is when we look at the at, at that at Cascades West, that mm -hmm. there's not none of the entities that are represented there are involved in recovery in mm -hmm. any meaningful like paying attention as far as I can tell mm -hmm. to recovery. So um, you suggested there might be other substitutes for an mm -hmm. economic development district. Do you have anything mm -hmm. in particular in mind or I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not thinking chambers of commerce is what you have in mind. You're probably thinking more public entities, but I don't, I'm not sure. So I'm looking for other options. Yeah, so. Well, I, mean, I think. Um, part part of the goal would be to have. To, to the extent that you are seeing applications that are economic revitalization, that you've got somebody with knowledge of that area, even if they don't have knowledge of specific recovery issues. So from that standpoint, you know, I think a, a staff member from the, the COG could well serve that role. Um, I think we we um, if there I think there is a, a fairly small um, economic development group, right? That is it is specific to the Mackenzie Valley. I'm blanking on their names, um, but it, I think we, we would not object to to um, uh, uh, less formal, less recognized economic development entity uh, spilling that seat. OK. Thanks. Right on. Um, well, I, I'm certainly happy to to hang out for a few minutes as there may be you all may be formulating more questions, but um, we will be following up with a recording um, and also a write up of the questions that we have answered. So, um, so if you if folks um, want to drop off, you're welcome to. Uh, and uh, like I said, I'll I'll hang out just in case. Thanks, Alex. This is helpful. Appreciate yeah, it. Good. Thank you, man.
All right. Well, I have a feeling that a lot of you all are probably doing something else, and that's the only reason that you haven't left yet. But uh, so I think I might as well shut it down. Um, thank you all. Um, we'll look forward to any additional questions via email. Thanks, Alex. See you tomorrow. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Alex.